Our sermon passage today comes from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading from Psalm 23. If you turn there and follow along while I read aloud. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, thanks, Mackenzie. Well, this morning we continue our sermon series um, in the book of Psalms. And if you were here last week, you may remember that we began... Um, our series last week and looking at Psalm chapter 1 and kind of during the introduction and beginning of my sermon, I mentioned how we're not preaching this in a series in which we're preaching consecutively through um, each of the Psalms, all 150 of them. Uh, that would take a while, but instead we're from now, uh, beginning of October through the end of the year, uh, we're just looking at selected Psalms uh, that, that we pray and hope as elders would, would be an encouragement to you and would serve you well, and that God would use them in different ways um, just in your life. And so this morning, um, we're looking at what most of us or many people would consider probably one of the, if not the, most well-known, most beloved Psalms of all the Psalms, and that's Psalm chapter 23. And so this is a Psalm that's probably been read at more funerals than any other passage in the Bible. This is a psalm that's been read at, in hospital rooms and at hospital beds, probably more than any other passage in the Bible. There's probably another, not another passage in the Bible that's been as memorized, cross-stitched, framed, made into bookmarks as this psalm, Psalm chapter 23. Like, and for good reason, right? Like one of the reasons this, is, this psalm is so popular and one of the reasons that people love this psalm so much is because Psalm chapter 23 is known as a psalm of trust. It's known as a psalm of, of, of confidence. It's a psalm in which David is expressing his trust, in which David expre is expressing his confidence in the Lord, even in the midst of great fear, and even in the midst of great uncertainty, and even in the midst of great danger that's going on in his life. And so that's why, it's one of the reasons then why so many run to this psalm when a loved one dies. And why so many people run to this psalm when they're afraid, and they're scared out of their mind, and they're crippled by fear and anxiety and worry in their life, and they're uncertain about their future. Or when they're suffering and walking through trial and pain and hardship in their life. They run to this psalm because of all the, the chapters and all the passages in the Bible. This psalm gives us words to express our trust and our confidence in the Lord when we need it the most. That this psalm, in those moments that, that we feel like life's just falling apart, like life's just unraveling, when the, when the pain in our heart is so strong and, and severe, and we struggle and wonder, is God, can God really be trusted? Can, can I really have confidence in, in him and his word and the promises he's made? I'm struggling to trust him. I'm struggling to have confidence in him. 
I read all this in the Bible and all the promises, but I feel and see all the experiences and circumstances I have in my life, and I'm struggling to reconcile the two. And can I trust him? Can I have confidence in him? Like, I wonder, is, is, is that anybody here this morning? Like, are you walking through something right now that's hard, that's, that's difficult? And if you were honest, you're finding it really, really hard to trust the Lord. in. Or are you up all night, like just tossing and turning in bed, just crippled with worry, worried about finances, worried about a health scare and a health issue, worried about your kids, worried about your job, worried about your future, worried about just fill in the blank for yourself. Or are you here this morning, just if you, if you were honest, just you'd say, man, I'm losing hope. I'm lonely. I feel all alone. Look at my circumstance. I'm just I'm struggling to trust the Lord. Like if, if that's you this morning, my prayer for you is this, is that this psalm, this particular psalm, Psalm chapter 23, would, would just fill your heart with confidence and fill your heart with trust in the Lord, that this psalm would free you from the worry, from the anxiety, from the fear and uncertainty that, that you've been struggling with in your life, that's been keeping you up at night. And instead, it would fill you with the trust and confidence in the Lord that only Psalm 23 can provide for you. And that's what we're going to see here in this chapter this morning. What we're going to see are, are two reasons, two reasons for why you can trust the Lord in the midst of whatever you're walking through here this morning. Two reasons why you can trust the Lord no matter what you might face and no matter what you might be experiencing here this morning. And the first reason he gives, the psalmist gives, is, is this. Here's why you can trust him. There's two reasons, and these two reasons are basically two images or two, two pictures, two portraits of who God is. And the first reason you can trust him is this. It's because the Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. This is what, what the psalmist confesses right from the get-go there in verse 1. Look there with me at verse 1. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. You may notice here in your Bibles that the word Lord here is in all capital letters. So capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And the reason for that is because anytime the word Lord is in all capital letters in your English translation is because it's a reference to God's personal name, Yahweh. It's a reference to God's personal name, meaning his, his covenant-keeping name, his, the name by which he, he, he enters into covenant relationship with us. It's the, his personal covenant name, Yahweh. Which again, it, that's the name by which he entered into covenant relationship with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's the name, if you remember, that he appeared to Moses at the burning bush. It's the name by which he rescued Israel out of bondage and out of slavery in, in Egypt. And so then put all that together, right? David then here is saying, that same God who did all of those things, the, the Lord God Yahweh, that God is my shepherd. And if you're a Christian here this morning, then you can say the same thing. You can say that the Lord is your, the Lord is my shepherd. And if you're here this morning and you're, you're walking through difficulty, you're, you're walking through just times of uncertainty in your life right now, then here's why that matters. Here's why it matters that the Lord is your shepherd. Like, please hear, hear this. Take this to heart. Here's, here's why it matters that the Lord is your shepherd. First, it matters because since he's your shepherd, he provides for you completely. He provides for you completely. This is the point David goes on to make in the rest of verse 1 there. Look at, look at verse 1. He begins verse 1 by confessing that the Lord is a shepherd. And then he says this, I shall not want. And there's a connection between those two things right there, right there in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, and he doesn't use this word because he's writing poetry, but he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, since the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Meaning, 
I don't lack anything. I don't lack anything. There is absolutely nothing that I need. I've got everything I need. Since the Lord is my shepherd, he provides everything I need. And there is therefore nothing that I lack. Now, in saying that, it's really important to understand what David is not saying here. He's not saying that since the Lord is our shepherd, he'll give us everything we want or everything we desire. So the Lord is my shepherd, I want a car. Lord is my shepherd, I want a new TV. Lord is my shepherd, I want a boat. That's not what David is saying here. Instead, he's saying that the Lord will give us, the Lord has given him everything he needs. And there's a huge difference between what we want and what we need. But think about it, right? This is what a shepherd does, doesn't he? He watches over his sheep. He looks out after his sheep. And he makes sure that his sheep have absolutely everything that they need and that they don't lack anything that they need. And so then think about this, right? Imagine for a moment if you were a sheep. Like I know most of us, including the preacher, knows absolutely nothing about sheep, okay? But imagine for a moment that you were a sheep. What does a sheep need? Not, not like what does a sheep want, but what does a sheep need? Like what are the basic necessities of a sheep? Well, in my extensive research this week, I found out that the basic necessities of a sheep are food, water, and rest. Good to go. Sheep has that, good to go. Well, that's what, if you continue to read in verse 2 and continue to read in verse 3, that's what David says that the Lord, his shepherd, provides for him in verse 2 and in verse 3. Look there with me. He says in verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. What does the sheep do in green pastures? He eats. And why does he lie down in green pastures? Because he's full. He's satisfied. He's not hungry anymore. He's full. So the Lord here provides David food. But that's not all he provides. And in the rest of verse 2, David says that he leads me beside still waters. If you have an ESV, you might notice there that there's a, a footnote there besides the word still waters there in verse 2. If you look down at the very bottom, at the footnote at the very bottom of the page, it says that that could be translated also as the words besides waters of rest. Besides waters of rest. Because that's what water does. It refreshes sheep. It gives sheep rest. So the Lord provides him food. The Lord provides him water. And as a result of that, look what David says in verse 3. He says that the Lord his shepherd then as a result then restores his soul. The word soul there could also be translated as the word breath. Or it could also be translated as the word life. And the word restores here means to return or to, to bring back something. And so put all that together, right? The picture, the imagery that we're supposed to see here is that of a hungry, thirsty, famished, weary sheep that just hobbling along and, and barely hanging on, barely making it. But then you have a shepherd of that sheep taking that sheep to green pastures to eat, and then leading that sheep to, to waters of rest to drink from. And as a result of, of eating in that green, those green pastures and drinking from those waters of rest, then that shepherd has provided that sheep absolutely everything that that sheep needs, and it's restored then the strength and the energy and the life of his sheep. And so then all of this, verse 2 and verse 3, what it's doing is that David's illustrating what he just said in verse 1. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
I don't lack food because he makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't lack water because he, he leads me beside still waters. I don't lack rest because he restores my soul. I don't lack anything. I have everything I need because the Lord, my shepherd, provides everything I need perfectly and completely. This right here isn't just true for literal sheep. And it's just not true for King David. It's also true for everyone in this room this morning who's a follower of Jesus Christ. Like if you're here this morning, then please, and walking through hard stuff in your life, then here's the truth you really need to hear. That no matter what you're going through right now, and that no matter how hard and painful, difficult things, things might be, you don't lack anything. You don't lack one thing at all. Nothing. You don't need anything. Like I know right now it feels like you lack a lot of things. It feels like you like this and that and that and that. If I only had that and that. You don't, you lack nothing. Why? Because you got a shepherd who's watching over you and looking out for you and, and making sure you got everything you need. And he's providing for you perfectly and completely. And so if you're here this morning, your, your heart is just weighed down with grief and sorrow. He provides you peace. Or if you're here this morning, you're in despair and just weighed down with anxiety, then he provides hope. Or if you're exhausted and weary and you don't know if you can keep on keeping on, he, he provides strength. Like whatever you need, not whatever you want, but whatever you need, essentially, ultimately need, he's got it. And he's watching out and looking out for you to make sure he, he provides it for you. Like no, make no mistake about it, you have a shepherd who is perfectly taking care of you. And you don't want, there's nothing you lack. But that's not all your shepherd does. Secondly then, he doesn't just provide for you. Secondly, he also leads you. He also leads you. This is what David goes on to say in verse 3. He says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Again, if you have an ESV, you'll notice there's a, there's a footnote at the very end of Paths of Righteousness, and you follow that footnote down the very bottom of the, bottom of the page. It says, or in right paths. And so then that's another way this phrase, Paths of Righteousness, can be translated. It can be translated as, He leads me in right paths. And so then I wonder, is anybody here this morning just like wrestling with, with a major decision in your life. Doesn't have to be major, but wrestling with any decisions in your life. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I take this? Should I choose this? Should I go down this road? Should I take down this road? Like, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Like maybe it's a parenting decision. Maybe it's a job-related issue. Maybe it's some sort of complicated, complex, like relational issue and decision in your life. Like for all of us, we're all wrestling with decisions and choices in our lives. And in the midst of that, it's easy to stress out. It's easy to grow anxious. It's easy to be afraid because we don't know where to go or what to do. And what's, what happens if we choose this way and that way and all of these things. But in the midst of those decisions and not knowing which path to take and which choice to make and all of those things, we need to remember something. We're just dumb sheep but we got a shepherd. We, we don't have to figure out where to go and what path to take. He's the one who's got to figure that out. He's the one who leads us in the right path. And just think about that. You can trust him for that. He's never once going to lead you down the wrong path. He's never going to once lead you to a wrong turn. He's never once going to lead you to a place where, you, where you're lost and you're wondering, not knowing for sure where you are and all those things. He's never once going to lead you where you're not supposed to go. You can trust Him. 
He'll always lead you in the right path, in the path of righteousness. Always. It's at this point then, not be good to pause and ask the question, why? Why? Like, why is the Lord our shepherd going to do all this for us? Why, why is he going to make us lie down in green pastures and provide for us in that way? Why is he going to lead us beside still waters? Why is he going to restore us perfectly and provide for us in all these ways? Why is he going to lead us in right paths and paths of righteousness? So like, why is he going to do all this? Like, what's his motivation for being so kind and generous to us in these ways? Well, we see his motive at the very end of verse 3. Look there with me. David says that, the Lord, our shepherd, does all this and is going to do all this. Look there. For his name's sake. Like at first glance, you read that, and you're like, huh? <laughs> what? I, I, th I thought he was doing it all for me. But David says he's doing it all for, for himself. That seems a little weird to say the least. But you're right. That's, that's exactly why God does this and is doing all this. It's, it's not the only reason, so please hear that. But it is a big reason. It is a, a chief reason for why he's doing all this. But the point you need to hear is this. This is really, really, really good news for you. That God is doing all this for his name's sake. That's really good news for you. And here's how. Again, what's God's name? We saw it earlier in verse 1, right? Yahweh. And the name Yahweh is what? It's God's covenant name. It's the name he entered into covenant relationship with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and later on with David and ultimately with us in the new covenant in Christ. And with this covenant then that the Lord God Yahweh made, with this covenant came promises of how he was going to provide and protect and care for and lead his special covenant people. And so then if God then somehow reneges on those promises and doesn't provide and care for and lead and fulfill his end of the, the covenant and, and his end of the promises, then what's going to happen? His name, his reputation is going to be tarnished. His name, his reputation is going to be diminished. And so then one of the reasons that we can be 100% completely, totally sure and confident that he's always going to care for us and lead us and provide for us and protect us is because we know that he's going to do it because his name's at stake. His name's on the line. And so we can be confident and sure that he's going to fulfill these promises and provide and, and protect us and lead us and, and fulfill his, the part of the covenant that he's made with us because his name's on the line and his name's at stake. So it's in this way then that God doing all this for his name and the reputation of his name is a really, really good news and good thing for us because we know that he won't ever do anything that will allow his name and his reputation to be tarnished and diminished. So the Lord, your shepherd, listen to this, especially if you're in the midst of difficulty, like personalize this. He, he's your shepherd, so he provides for you. He leads you. And then thirdly, he is with you. He's with you. So what David goes on to say in verse four, look there with me. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. So in verse four, you might notice there's a change of scenery, right? We go from green pastures and still waters in verses 1 through 3 to a dark valley in verse 4. And this right here would have been common for sheep and shepherds in, in David's day. Like in that day, uh, shepherds would have sometimes had to walk a long way through rough terrain and a whole host of other things in order to find green pastures. 
in order to, pro to find waters of rest and, and still waters. And along the way, they would often have to walk through these, these deep ravines and, um, and valleys, which were sometimes dark because of the shadows um, being cast over those, those valleys and those ravines. And, and they just weren't dark, though. Because they were dark, they were also dangerous. Because they were dark, a, a lot of times there would be people hiding out there who would try and ambush you. And there would be dangerous animals hiding behind certain boulders and rocks and all those sorts of things who would attack the sheep and all those things. So it's dangerous, this, this valley of darkness. And that's the image then that David's painting here. And again, if you have an ESV, you'll notice that there's a footnote besides, beside the words, the valley of the shadow of death. And if you look at the footnote at the bottom of the page and trace it all the way down, it says, or the valley of deep darkness. And that would be a more literal translation. That yeah, it, it can refer to, yes, so please hear this, it can refer to death as the ESV translates it. So Job uses this phrase a lot in reference to death. But it can also be a reference to any difficulty, any hardship that you might be walking through, any suffering or hardship you might be walking through in your life. It's not just a valley of death, it's a valley of deep darkness. And again, many of you know this valley all too well. That right now, you're walking through this valley of, of deep darkness. And many of you are in it right now, and some of you will be in it before too long. And if that's you this morning, walking through this valley of deep darkness, here's what you need to know. You're not walking in that valley alone. Oh, it might feel like you're all alone. It might feel like nobody in the world is with you. And there you are, just plodding along through that valley with darkness all in that valley, just scared out of your mind, uncertain about what's five steps in front of you, not knowing what might jump out and try and get you and attack you and all those things. But guess what? You're not just a lone little sheep walking through that valley all by yourself, all by your little lonesome. You got a shepherd with you. You're not alone. And since that shepherd with you, verse four, you got nothing to fear. You got absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Not because you're so brave and courageous to be able to walk through deep darkness by yourself. No, but because of the one who's with you. The Lord God, Yahweh, your shepherd walking with you. He provides for you, he leads you, he is with you, and then finally, he protects you. Since the Lord is your shepherd, he protects you. Look at the, see this at the very end there of verse four, David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In that day, a shepherd would carry a rod, it's kind of this smaller instrument in his belt, in order to de defend off any animals that might come to, to attack his sheep. He, he'd, he'd beat the tar out of him. Uh, so he's going to give you a picture of it, but we're not going to do that this morning. But then he would also carry this staff, and, which was basically this walking stick, to, and that staff would help him to, to control and guide the sheep. If, they need a little, if they're kind of getting off course and you need a little nudge to, to keep on course, you know, a little nudge in the right direction, just kind of a little love tap to, to keep them on, on the right path, on the right course. And the imagery here then of this rod and the staff, it, it's this imagery of protection. It's the imagery of the, of the shepherd defending, fighting for, protecting his sheep. And it also, to apply it to us, is a picture also of how the Lord, our shepherd, fights for us and defends us and protects us. Now in saying that, that doesn't mean when we talk about the Lord protecting us, the Lord, our shepherd, protecting us, that doesn't mean that he's going to protect us from every difficulty or from every trial in this life or that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you if the Lord is your shepherd. Instead, the very beginning of verse 4, we're walking through a valley of deep darkness and he's taking us there. And so, yes, trouble will come, difficulty will come, suffering will come, all of those things will come. 
But here's what this whole idea of the Lord protecting us, defending us, what this means for us as Christians in the new covenant on this side of the cross. It means John chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, but if you're not familiar with John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking. And listen to what Jesus says and how it relates to Psalm chapter 23 here. Jesus says, I, talking about himself, in the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Man, that will bring tears to your eyes. Do you see the beautiful picture there? That when we as Jesus' sheep are threatened, Jesus doesn't flee like the hired hands do. He doesn't flee. Instead, when we're in danger and threatened, he lays down his life to protect us. And one of the primary places in which he demonstrates this is none other than the cross. It's that when the danger of God's wrath was barreling toward us for our sin, Jesus didn't flee. Instead, Jesus, as our good shepherd, stepped in and he laid down his life for us to protect us by dying the death that we deserve for our sins. And then three days later, he rose from the dead to protect us and rescue us from death. Like that's the extreme. Like that's how far Jesus will go and that's how far Jesus has gone to protect his sheep. And so then, put all this together. I know life is hard for many of you. I know life is difficult. You're walking through a valley of deep darkness. But please hear this. Because of Jesus' life, because of Jesus' death, because of Jesus' resurrection, you're protected. You're, You're protected. Like nothing can ultimately kill you. Nothing. Because even if it does... Your dead body's coming back to life one day and you're going to live forever. Like you're protected. No sin can ever be counted against you. You're protected. The inheritance, you have an inheritance that's reserved for you in the new creation to come that can't ever be taken from you. It's protected. You're protected. Like nothing can ever snatch you out of, out of the Father's hand. You're protected. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. You're protected. And so then put all that together, right? You're ultimately protected. You have a defender who will fight for you and protect you. As he walked through the valley of deep darkness in your life. And so that's the first reason here that we can trust God in the midst of whatever we find in our lives and what we're walking through. It's that he's our shepherd. He provides for us. He leads us. He's always with us. He protects us. The second reason we can trust him is this. And you can see it on your hand out there. He's not only our shepherd, but he's our host. He's our host. It's what David goes on to say in verses 5 and and verse 6 there. In these last two verses there, if you notice, he switches metaphors. In verses 1 through 4, it's all the metaphor. It's all the picture of the image of the Lord being our shepherd. And now in verses 5 and 6, it's the image of the Lord being our host. And since he's our host then, we're his honored guest. We're his honored guest. Oh, this is the picture David paints there in verse 5. Look there with me. And imagine the scene he paints there in verse 5. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Like in David's day, like hospitality was a really, really big deal. 
Like the host, you, you show up at the, the host home, he, he would go all out in lavishing his guest with abundance of food and, and drink and this big feast and this big meal. And that's what David here is describing here. He's describing this lavish feast with, with abundance of food and abundance of, of drink. That's why he uses the word overflows there in verse, in verse 5. He says his cup overflows. It, it overflows because there's an abundance. The host just keeps filling the cup, just keeps filling the cup, just keeps filling the cup. And the cup's just so full, it's just overflowing more and more and more and more. And all of this then is another example, we'll put all this together, of what David said earlier in, in verse 1. I shall not want. David's once again describing how he doesn't lack anything. And the reason he doesn't lack anything is because he has a host who's prepared a table for him. And on this table is just a whole bunch of food and a whole bunch of, whole bunch of drink just overflowing. And look where this is happening, though. It's happening where? Did you notice that? In the presence of his enemies, meaning it's happening in the midst of imminent danger. It's happening in the midst of threats. In the midst of all that, there's a table that's been prepared for him. Just lavish more and more and more food to satisfy him and to supply everything that he might want and everything that he might need, and then some. He doesn't lack anything. He's got, he got, he got more than he needs. It's overflowing even in the midst of threats and danger and trouble. And you might not think of it this way or think what you're walking through right now this way, but this picture is true for you as well. Like your enemies not, might, might not be people chasing after you to try and kill you. Your enemy right now might be a financial difficulty or a health issue or uncertainty or worry and fear about this or that or whatever it might be. But in the presence of whatever, whatever difficulty you're walking through right now, don't just look around and see the difficulty. Look and see the table. There's a table there in the presence of all the difficulty you're walking through. And that table has been prepared for you by God, your host, so that you can come and feast and enjoy his abundant provision and enjoy communion and fellowship with him. In the midst of what you're walking through right now, in the presence of what you're walking through right now, he's provided you exactly everything that you need and then some. Your blessings are overflowing. He's provided steadfast love. He's provided hope. He's provided grace. He's provided peace. He's provided mercy. He's provided strength. He's provided intimate communion and fellowship with him. You have more than you need in that song. But that's not all. It gets even better. He, he's our, the Lord is our host, and because he's our host, we're his honored guest. But as his honored guest, then, then secondly, his goodness and mercy then will follow you all the days of your life. So what he goes on to say that next there in verse 6, look there with me. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's important to note here that, that word mercy is, the, Greek, or is the, the Hebrew word hesed. And that word hesed is a reference to God's covenant-keeping love. In other words, it's a reference to his loyalty, his faithfulness to keep covenant with you to keep covenant, to fulfill the promises that he's made in the covenant, his loyalty, his faithfulness, his steadfast love, to keep those promises in the covenant that he's made with you. And so then, when it comes to David, God made a covenant with David's forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He made a covenant with David, and part of the covenant that he made with them involved providing for them and, and protecting them and leading them and caring for them and, and, and all of those things. 
And so then when David says then that surely goodness and hesed, steadfast love, covenant loyalty shall follow me all the days of, his li- all the days of my life, That's his way then of saying that God's loyalty and faithfulness to the promises that he's made with David are going to follow David all the days of his life. In other words, there's no place that David's ever going to be able to go that God's loyalty to his promises isn't there. They're always going to follow David wherever he goes all the days of his life. And if you're a Christian here this morning, the same thing is true for you. God's goodness, His covenant-keeping love and loyalty to all the promises He's made to you are going to follow you wherever you go all the days of your life. There's nothing you can do to escape it. There's nothing you can do to outrun it. There's nothing you can do to hide from it. Instead, God's goodness is going to be right behind you. God's faithfulness and loyalty to his promises are going to be right behind you, following you all the days of your life. Just like our little dog follows my wife. Wherever she walks around that house, I mean, that dog is just on, I mean, just there. Can't even go to the bathroom without just that dog there. God's goodness, God's steadfast love to his promises he's made to you. I'm going to follow you. You're not going to be able to shake it off or get rid of it or outrun it. Wherever you go, it's going to pursue you and follow you. And that right there is really important, especially in times of walking through the valley of deep darkness. Because when you're walking through that deep valley, you're wondering, where's your goodness, God? God, I thought you were good. God, I thought you were faithful to your promises. I thought you were loyal to your promises. Are you, Man, I'm looking all around me. All I see is pain and heartache and suffering and life's hard and life's difficult. Are are you good, God? Are you faithful, God? Are you going to fulfill this promise, God? Uh, You don't have to ask those questions. His goodness and faithfulness to his promises are following you. They're with you. They're with you in that valley. You can't escape them. So then we're his honored guest. His goodness and mercy will follow us then all the days of our lives. And then finally, we'll conclude with this. We will dwell in his house forever. This is what David says at the very end of verse 6 there. Look there with me. He says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord's house that David is referring to is is a reference to God's temple, where where God dwells. And this is where the Lord, his shepherd, is ultimately leading David. He, he's taken him to, he, up to this point, he's taken him to green pastures. He's taken him to still waters. He's, he's taken him through valleys of deep darkness. But the reason he's taken David to all these different places is because they're on a journey. They're on a journey to get somewhere. And the place that they're journeying to and the place where the, the Lord, his shepherd, is ultimately taking him is to his house. The shepherd's ultimately taking him to his house where he will then dwell with him forever. And this right here then is where the Lord, our shepherd, is taking us as well. That yeah, right now you might be walking through a valley of deep darkness, but please know this, that's not your final destination. Like whatever you're walking through right now, it's not your final destination. Instead, the Lord, your shepherd, isn't just going to stop and leave you in the valley of darkness. He he got another plan for you, taking you somewhere else. He's taking you through the valley, through the green pastures, through the still waters in order to get you somewhere. And the place that he's trying to get you and the place that he's ultimately going to get you is to his house where you will live with him and dwell with him forever. Like just not an overnight stay or a week-long stay here or there. You're going to dwell there forever. And as you dwell in his house, you're not in your presence of your enemies anymore. All your enemies are gone for good. You don't have to walk through a valley of deep darkness ever again. Instead, you're in God's house where you just sit now as his honored guest for all of eternity, enjoying the ultimate consummation of all the promises that he's ever made to you. And you just sit there at his table that he's prepared for you, 
feasting and celebrating with your cup overflowing for billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of years. Oh, this is why you can trust the Lord no matter what you're going through in your life right now. He's your shepherd. And as your shepherd, you don't have anything to fear or worry about. He'll provide for you and take good care of you. He'll lead you. He'll always be with you. He'll protect you. But the Lord is also your host. You're his honored guest. His goodness and faithful loyalty to his promises will follow you all the days of your life. All the way to the point you dwell in this house forever. That's why you can trust. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness and thank you for your mercy that has and does follow us wherever we are and will continue to follow us all the days of our life. Thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you for our, being our generous host. And I pray for those that are here this morning that are struggling to trust you. And I pray that in the midst of spending, which is so easy to do, just meditating on their problems, meditating on what's wrong, meditating on what they lack, meditating on what they don't have, meditating on how life is hard, meditating on their pain, meditating on their suffering, meditating on their conflict and difficulty. It's so easy just let our minds just stay there and meditate on those things. But instead, Lord, I pray that they would meditate on something else this week. That they would meditate on how in the midst of where, where they find themselves, that, that they're not alone, that you're their shepherd. And that they would meditate on the fact that you're their host. And that they're your honored guest. And you've prepared a table for them. And therefore, they have absolutely everything they need. And then some. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.